The enemy used their years in France to turn the Channel ports into fortress Europe. Yet the Allies needed a harbour to land men if D-Day and Operation Overlord were to succeed. At a meeting following the Dieppe raid of August 1942, Vice Admiral John Hughes Hallett, the naval commander for the Dieppe raid, supported by Winston Churchill, declared that if a port could not be captured, then one should be taken across the channel. The big book of code names that was used for assigning operation names was consulted. Next available from the list was Mulberry, and so the Mulberry system of artificial harbours and landing piers was officially born. The Allies had agreed on the design of the three key elements of Mulberry a pierhead that allowed a number of different ship types and could accommodate the movement of wind, wave and tide, a connector from the pier to beach, and the means of producing sheltered water. The landing wharves, or spud piers as they were known, where ships were unloaded, consisted of a pontoon with four legs that rested on the sea bed as an anchor, yet allowed it to float up and down freely with the tide. The idea of using spud legs and a floating roadway to a shore evolved over several months based on a Lummet dipper dredger called the AB95 Lucienne. The pierhead was to be a relatively simple design, steel construction with each corner having a 90-foot spud leg that could be raised and lowered by diesel motors, thus raising or lowering the platform. Because it rested on its spud legs, it would provide a stable platform for ships to unload. Various adaptions were made to suit the particular operational functions of each pontoon, and it was not surprising that the contractors failed to keep to schedule. The completion of the first batch of pierheads should have been ready by the end of March. R. D. Davis, Deputy Director General of the Royal Engineers Equipment in the Ministry of Supply, addressed a meeting of the British Structural Iron Association in London during the first week of April. The response was immediate. A force of 300 welders from various firms was rapidly assembled at Southampton. They had no knowledge of the work they had to do except that it was vital and desperately urgent. The first five pierheads were completed by the 10th of May and, according to Davis, saved the situation. Work was also impeded by the lack of mobile cranes. On investigation it was discovered that a number were being used for shipping coal in South Wales. They were immediately commandeered and brought to Southampton. Once the ship was unloaded, its vehicles or stores would need to be transferred to shore by some form of flexible roadway or bridge span. If the pierhead was relatively simple, the roadway was far from it because it would be required to accommodate lateral as well as vertical movement in each span. Torsional flexibility would also need to be considerable and this would require the use of complex spherical bearings. Supporting these bridge span roadways would be a series of floating pontoons called beetles, each required to support a total weight of 56 tonnes each, including a 25 tonne single load, usually a tank. The original concept used a design derived from a Thames barge. A further addition allowed the unloading and loading using a sloping ramp called a buffer pontoon that was connected using a flexible hinge. At Marchwood, a special carriage was run under each beetle on the building berth. The float was then rolled down the concrete slipway into the water and floated off the undercarriage. It is reported that the civilian labour force was recruited from the most unlikely quarters, including flower sellers and pimps. The whale road span assembly gang consisted of 12 men, including one steel erector. The two main girders were assembled flat and raised upright by crane, with 15 feet between them. The connecting components were then hoisted into position and the cross girder fastened and the steel roadway laid. The spans were finally lifted to the jetty where they were lifted by a 30-ton crane and placed onto the beetles. By D-Day, the troops at Marchwood had assembled about three miles of whale roadway. Wave attenuation or the production of sheltered water was a particularly difficult problem for the design team. 
the overseeing committee worked on a number of options for the production of sheltered water, and in the end, three systems were used, concrete caissons or phoenixes, floating cruciforms, known as bombardons, and sunken block ships, gooseberries. In the light of some reassessment of the significance to Operation Overlord, commentators have described possession of Mulberry as strategically giving military planners the freedom to choose a landing area away from the heavily fortified major ports and a degree of confidence without which the venture, which seems so hazardous, might never otherwise be undertaken.